Good day, ladies and gents, and welcome to this worked example. We're going to be looking at the design of a steel back-to-back -back angle in compression, which we'll see is a singly symmetric section. We're designing this according to SANS 10162 Part 1. So just to introduce the problem, uh, the section below is a back-to-back -back angle, which is the bottom chord of a truss. The steel is commercial grade. Purlins are spaced at 1,700 millimeters apart with verticals at each purlin. Knee braces are positioned at every second purlin. There's a 6 millimeter gusset between the sections. Determine the following. A, the compressive resistance of a compound section, assuming that the connection between the angles is sufficient for them to function as a, second, as a single unit. And then B, which we'll do in the next video, the maximum spacing of interconnecting gussets between the angles. Check using the simple rule in the class notes and then do a detailed check on the individual section as backup. Now, firstly, make sure you have a copy of the set of notes. The PDF will be available um, and we'll be going through that now. And as I said, the second part, part B, we'll look at in the next video. So just having a look at the section, here is what the details of our section is. We have a back-to-back -back ang angle, this double section here, but it's made up of these two sections, well, two of these sections, which is an angle 60, 65 by 50 by 6, but it has been rotated and then put next to another angle. Uh, our shear center is there, halfway through the thickness, and uh, the angles of the U and V axes are given as well. Now, with when designing it, we've been given the specifications of what the truss looks like. Now, on a question, you might not actually be given a drawing of what the physical structure is, but in this picture, I've drawn out what we how we're going to be designing this and how we're going to be looking at. So this is the bottom cord, and this is what the truss of such a section may look like. Here, here's the truss elevation. And firstly, with vi uh, viewing this video, make sure your resolution is turned up so you can see the details. Here we've got the truss. We are designing this bottom cord here between this knee brace and this knee brace. And... It's about 1,700 millimeters between purlins, so there's our purlins on top. We want to design the section here. The way I've drawn this is not to scale. I've enlarged the, the size of the members just so you can see it, but we're designing that green element. And it is restraint because of the members around it. If it is going to try buckle vertically, it's got supports at each position. But if it tries to buckle sideways we have these things called these knee braces. So those are not necessarily on every purlin. They might be every second or every third, depending on the, the structural engineer and what's designed. And this is a section through it. So that's section AA, uh, which we've just taken through a typical section there, which you've got some sort of brace that goes up to the purlin above and it prevents this thing from buckling sideways so we call that a knee brace and there's our bottom cord so we are designing that angle and uh, we need to make sure that it is sufficiently strong the way it's orientated makes sense because we've positioned what now becomes the strongest axis so that it buckles sideways about the longest effective length because coming back just to have a look at this problem if we put this bottom cord into compression and it tries to buckle vertically so it tries to go in this direction either up or down it cannot go up there there or there so we're going to have a failure like that we are effective length is just going to be 1700 millimeters however if we squash this and it tries to buckle sideways it's only prevented from moving sideways at the position of the knee braces. So then for about what we'll call soon the YY axis, it'll be from there to there. So it's the full 3.4 meters because there's nothing preventing sideways movement. It's only where these knee braces are that we can prevent sideways movement. Uh, so that's for our Y primed axis and then up or down we'll call the X-primed axis. So we'll use those in our calculations when we, we do our design. So coming now to the, um, the equations, but firstly, just quickly before we do that, just so you can also see this once again, this is a similar sort of structure. We will be designing the bottom cord there. 
If it is to, to fail vertically, it'll fail between points. But horizontally, we have a knee brace there, and there, and there. So it's every second purlin, this one as well. So once again, it's a much longer effective length. But as I mentioned before, we've also positioned our stiffest axis about the longest effective length, which is logical. So we have the strongest axis for the sort of, well, the strongest part of the member for the weakest, the longest section. So coming now to the equations, we, go, we have to come back and design this. So there's our double angle. Just to remind you of the problem, we need now to determine how it behaves as a section. I've listed all the properties of the member here in from the Red Book, the South African Steel Construction Handbook. Uh, there, table 214, properties of a single angle 65 by 50 by 6. I've used firstly the axis in the red book convection X and Y for all those properties, for the area IX, RX, etc, etc. This we also were told it's commercial grade. This is sort of an anomaly in South Africa. We have this strange grade called commercial grade. It's generally only for smaller angles and unknown other types of, of sections, not for bigger structural sections. It has a 200 MPA yield, and uh, yeah, so we, we're working with a property like that. When we determine the properties of the compound angle, first determine the properties of the compound angle, assuming that the section is fully effective. So we're not going to reduce it for being class 4. Axis convention is to be changed as shown above. If there was a standard gusset plate thickness here, this is 6 moles, but if it was an 8 mole section, we could actually read the values from table 420 in the red book. We wouldn't need to calculate it, but here we've got a non-standard one, so we've got to calculate it. Our area of both sections together is just twice the, the original. But now when it comes to work out the stiffnesses, I've taken this section, there's, there's our, our angle, uh, and we've rotated it now, so the axis convention is swapped. That upstand is now lying horizontally, which means our R, our Y axis now has shifted to our um, sort of X primed axis. So we've rotated this round. That's why for this, I've labeled this Y primed and X primed, just so that you realize there's a different axis system. This is not as per code. The code, they just still call it Y and X. But I found in the past, students get quite confused with that when these are both labeled Y and X. So Y primed and X primed is just the fact that we've got two axis systems. When we're now trying to work out the properties about the X primed and Y primed of the combined system, the centroid for bending about the x-axis occurs at the centroid of a single angle, i.e. 12.9 mils from the bottom. So here we've got the one angle. There is our centroid. The centroid of each of these angles is thus there and there. However, on average, because we're looking for the centroid of the combined, on average, our centroid sits there. So that is our, our centroid. So we're going to be designing everything about that. And when we want to now calculate the IX primed value, that's twice the IY prime value, uh, the IY value, not Y prime, the IY value of the single section rotated. Because we've gone from X prime Y to X primed, we've rotated this by 90 degrees. IX is twice the Y value. And Simply that. We don't have to do anything else, simply because the centroids correspond. But now when we work out our IY primed value, so that's the bending stiffness about Y primed, I've got an angle. The contribution of each member, so this angle here, it's its original IX value. It's AY squared. You probably would know this is the parallel axis system or something similar. So it'll be IX plus AY squared of the individual about IY prime because we're working with two axis systems. So that is the calculation you see here. IY primed is twice the area of one angle times Y squared. AX, is, according to the red book, is the distance from the centroid to the edge. So that's our AX value there. 
plus the thickness of the gusset divided by 2. So it's just what is the distance from the middle to the new centroid of each section. Ay squared plus the Ix of the original, and we carry these calculations through. And then we will get to a stiffness about the Iy primed axis of that. And already we can see that it's much stiffer about the Y primed axis, which makes sense. It's much taller, therefore much stronger. This is only 50 mils deep versus 136 mils uh, deep. So the, the Iy primed is much stiffer. Then our R values, they are just the Rx primed. Just be careful if your PDF didn't print right. It's fine in the electronic copy, but often prints a bit funny. That's a square root. Square root of Ix over A. And then those are the values we've calculated. And we can get our Rx and Ry primed values. And once again, the R value sort of represents the average distance of material about an axis. So we can see Rx, it's roughly on average material is about 14 mils away from this axis. And Y prime, it's about 31 mils. Yes, so there's about the average material in this direction and the average material in this direction. It's just a useful way to understand the radius of gyration. Then, once we have those values, we can start calculating the section classification, determine if it is going to experience local buckling. Our breadth of the thickness, I'm just only going to use the one. Simply, I'm taking the longest one and find that the Total width of the thickness, 10.8. This is less than the allowable limit. Therefore, it's a class 3 section. I could have checked the other one as well, the 50 mils. But if the 65 works, obviously the 51 will work. I now know it's section. It's class 3. Therefore, it's not going to experience local buckling. We're now going to determine the slenderness of the section about each axis. That's the KL over R. For the X primed axis, the, mix, the member will buckle vertically between vertical members. For the Y primed axis, the member will buckle laterally between the knee braces. So LY primed 1700, LY, LX is 1700, LY primed is 34. We've discussed this previously and explained that. For truss, we normally take our effective length as 1. Some of the older codes and older engineers will use 0.85, accounting for the stiffness of the gusset plate, but Generally, we don't do that. Uh, you should use a value of 1. So our x-axis slenderness, kl x primed over r, we get 1165, y primed um, 109.7. Then buckling about xx dominates and limits the strength. So we'll see shortly. The code only uh, check, tells us to check the normally the x primed and the fey primed z, but we're checking both simply because there's different effective lengths about different axes. So when that happens, you should actually check both. So now we know since this axis is longer, it's our x primed axis. Make sure it's always, you know, which axis system you're dealing with. We're going to check our um, strength about that axis. So this is now less than equal to 200, therefore it's okay, we've checked our limit. If section properties are known, this should be checked first, it's quick and you can do it relatively quickly. Now we're going to check our flexural and flexural torsional buckling. The column will buckle about either the X primed, Y primed, or flexurally torsional. This is because it's a singly symmetric section. There's one axis of symmetry, which is the Y primed axis. If it was an asymmetric section, a doubly symmetric section, or a cruciform, we would use a different approach. This is simply because it's a singly, we check X primed or Y primed. And because the axis uh, effective length is different, we're going to check either of those. So there is our buckling stress about the X primed, Y primed. And once again, this is slightly higher. Um, so that means it's stronger, so this is our weakest axis. Flexural torsional buckling, there's our equation. It's a combination of Y primed and Z, which is torsional buckling. Once again, often our PDFs don't print, so you can correct this if it didn't print correctly. Then we've got to run through this equation, and the omega value accounts for the distance of the uh, shear center from the centroid. To get these values, to get our... Ey prime z, so that's our lateral torsional value. We need to know an x primed naught and a y prime naught value. What is the distance of the shear center from the centroid? So this is our overall diagram once again. The shear center of a section occurs of an angle 
occurs over there at t over 2 from the edge. And this one also t over 2 from the edge. However, on average, it will occur there then. So that is the shear center of our combined section, simply because it's the average of the others. So that's our shear center. And there's our centroid in the middle. So we need to quantify the distance from the centroid to the shear center, which is then y naught primed. The x value is 0. There's no distance along the x-axis, so that's why our x naught primed is 0. Our y naught is going to be this distance. That distance there minus the thickness over 2. So coming back to the equations, you'll see it's a y minus t over 2, so that's the y prime naught, and our x prime naught is 0. Then we've got our r 0 prime. This quantifies the influence, as I said, of the x naught and y naught, the distance, as long with our radius of gyration. We run through that, and we have a value. Our mega further accounts for the buckling effect and torsional effects. We run through that, and we get a value. We can now get our torsional buckling stress once so these are elastic failure stresses so there's FEZ this is combined of warping torsion and synfinance torsion since for an angle our warping torsion is approximately equal zero if in doubt if you don't know when CW is zero just have a look at the front of the red book and if it gives you a CW value it means it has warping stiffness so then you use it if it doesn't give you a CW value you can assume it is zero so that means that term disappears and our J value, we're gonna, it's approximately twice the value of one section. So now this term is simplified just to the second height, and it's tw twice the value of one. So we have a elastic torsional buckling stress of 776.5. We run through, and now we can get our lateral torsional buckling stress, which is 168. Therefore... If this was a perfect column and we modeled it in abacus or procon or something, our buckling stress would occur at the minimum of our x, y, and z, I mean, e, y, z value. We've calculated these three above, and we can see that that um, governs, and it is buckling about our x primed axis. So this now is what will determine when it will fail. So it will actually fail upwards or downwards. Even though the effective length of, is half, the radius of gyration about that axis is much lower. Therefore, this axis governs. Once we have our elastic buckling stress, we convert it into a non-dimensional slenderness. For lateral buckling, calculate the compressive resistance about the weaker axis as per W symmetric X, and now it becomes relatively straightforward. We take our square root of the yield over our elastic, and we have a value. This is quantifying both the influence of yield and elastic buckling, or elastic yield and, and uh, yield and buckling. We get this value. We plug this in our traditional compressive resistance. We run through the equation and we get to a value of 118 kilonewtons. So that means when we load the section up, it will eventually fail at 118 kilonewtons. So each one is taking roughly about 59. And that will be then the failure capacity of our section. What we will then do in the next um, lecture is look at what happens to one section on its own as we design it. Thank you.